Some people wondered if I would have a voice left this morning. I do. <laughs> um, I'm not here to gloat, but, but <laughs> I felt like a lot of prayers were answered last night. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go Bills. <laughs> we don't know how far they'll go, but it was good last night. So, uh, so grateful for those of you who are here today. Uh, for those of you who uh, stayed up, we even had some who were at the game and they're here this morning and they're still trying to warm up and their voices are gone and, uh, and they're here. So, so grateful to have you. Uh, we're continuing on in the series um, about following Jesus and it's, it's more than just liking Jesus. Uh, it's more than just subscribing to an update from Jesus. How are we to think about this? And so this morning, what I want to talk about is when we struggle and we fail, how does that affect our ability to follow Jesus? How does that affect our ability to follow Jesus? The truth is that no one is perfect, which means we are called as imperfect people to follow a perfect Savior. How are we to think about that? And then we're surrounded by people who are also imperfect. So how are we to think about following a perfect savior when we are not perfect and all the people who are following with us are not perfect? How many can see this has a lot of potential for complications? Yeah. And so this morning we're going to spend some time uh, taking a look at this. When we fail, a lot of times we experience guilt. We feel hypocritical. We feel weak. And uh, so how are we supposed to respond to Jesus when we're feeling those things? And here's what I want you to see this morning. This is the first point, and I, I really want us to land on this today. Perfectionism is not the definition of Christianity. Perfectionism is not the definition of Christianity. Our tendency is to create classifications of followers of Jesus based on our perception of how well they are living their lives in terms of the decisions they make and their behaviors. But when we make mistakes, not if, but when we make mistakes, how are we to manage those mistakes and imperfections? We can actually look a lot, we can learn a lot by looking at someone in scripture today. There's one person that kind of stands out because of the incredible amount of information that we have, both good and bad about him. His name is David and he was the second king of Israel. He's a phenomenal character. He's one of those Renaissance guys who not only is an incredible warrior, he's also a gifted creative artist. He has a capacity to attract really good people, and he also has the capacity to do really dumb things. So how are we to think? Uh, we have a great deal of information about his life. First and second Samuel and first Kings contain a lot of the history, but we also have a lot of information about how he processed the feelings of his successes and failures because he wrote songs and prayers. In Psalms, there's 150 Psalms altogether. 73 are attributed to him. So 73 of the Psalms are attributed to him. And so we have a lot of information about his dealings with God and God's dealings with him. David grew up in a family where there was some sibling rivalry. His, his father didn't automatically assume great things about him. But even after things got better, things also got worse. And he winds up living for a season of his life in quite hostile environments. He lives out in the wilderness and he's being hunted down almost like an animal would be hunted by a very insecure man who's the first king of Israel and his name is Saul. And he learned how to live in the wilderness, which is not an easy place to learn how to live. One day in particular, this is a fascinating story. One day in particular, David and his men are running and hiding from Saul. And Saul is, is pursuing them. He hasn't seen them, but he's, he's heard rumors about where they might be. And so uh, David and his men, by reason of the heat of the day and by reason to avoid being seen, they hide out in a cave. And in that region, there are a lot of caves. And so they hide out in a cave. They were absolutely stunned to discover that walking into the cave all by himself is King Saul. 
And King Saul didn't see them there because the light outside, his eyes hadn't adjusted. And the reason he came into the cave is actually to use it as a restroom. They didn't have all the modern conveniences that we enjoy. And so he goes in to use this cave as a restroom. And David and all of his men are just standing in the back of the cave. And they couldn't believe their eyes. That, that you couldn't put this king in a more vulnerable situation than he is right then. And David's men give David the signal. You strike and you kill this man and you do it right now. And everything that's wrong with your life gets better and everything that you don't have, you will be rewarded with. This is the single best move. In fact, this has to be a gift from God. And David gives them a signal. He's not going to do it. And they signal back, let us do it. We'll strike him down. You don't have to worry about anything. And he won't let it happen in one blow. Everything he wanted could be his, and everything he didn't like could be gone. And he will not strike the king. The king finishes his business. He walks out of the cave. He actually gets across the ravine, and that's when David reveals himself and hollers out to the king. And the king suddenly realizes what just happened, and he is stunned. And David said to Saul, he said, why do you listen to the people who say, tell lies about me to you? Why do you believe them when they say that I would take your life if I had the opportunity? He said, I just had the opportunity. And he had done one thing while Saul was in the cave. He reached over with his sword and he cut off the end of Saul's robe. And he held up the piece of robe. And he said to Saul, if I wanted to strike you, I could have done it. The robe you are wearing is missing a piece. Let that be a reminder to you that I will not strike you down. I am not here to harm you. And you can imagine all the emotions that Saul had to be going through as well as David. So David said, I could have used that opportunity. I chose not to. Now, Saul is an interesting person. The Bible tells us that he stood head and shoulders above everybody else. He's very tall. He's a physically attractive person. But in terms of his emotions and his mental capacities, he's a very complex person, and he has a lot of weaknesses. And, and this is what's challenging about Saul is with all of his weaknesses, David could still see the king in him. The reason that David would not strike him down is because he could still see him as the God-ordained king of Israel. And how he could see that is unknown because, because this man, Saul, had made life miserable for David. Now, it's not as though David is a passive person. He's just kind of opposed to taking life or, or, or doing anything that is, that is violent. David had a reputation for being a serious warrior. We're introduced to him in scripture when he takes out a giant by the name of Goliath. The songs written about him is that he was responsible for the death of 10,000s of enemies while Saul was only uh, responsible for the death of thousands. He had a reputation for killing tens of thousands. He was a known killer. In fact, that's what people knew him best for. And when he had the perfect chance to strike down Saul, he doesn't do it. He doesn't consider that opportunity to take that life as a gift from God. Now, Saul had attempted to take David's life on two occasions in the palace because David was hired to work there as a person who would play and sing songs in order to help manage the emotions of the king. And on two occasions, Saul actually by his own hand tried to kill David. He also would send him out on military campaigns with inadequate support and inadequate resources, assuming that he would not survive the event. But David always did. He even had a situation where David pretended to be sick. The king actually thought he was sick and sent people into David's house and bedroom with the intent to kill him in his sleep in his bed. This is who Saul was. And yet David sees a king. How many would admit that would be hard to do? It's hard to see beyond the offense that that person is causing you. 
Uh, rumors had reached Saul about where David was, and so he brought his army with him. And, and what made David famous was his ability to kill. That's the reputation that he had. And it's fair to ask ourselves, is that a good reputation to have? So David's flaws uh, are not limited to taking life. As it turns out, he's capable of a lot of mistakes. It's a very well-known situation where he committed adultery with a woman by the name of Bathsheba. And in order to hide the unplanned pregnancy, he had her husband killed. David himself had eight wives, not including the concubines. He's hardly a model of God's original design for marriage. As a father, he had difficulty talking to his own sons about their out-of-bounds behavior, including one horrific story where one of his sons is responsible for the rape of one of his daughters. It was a young man by the name of Amnon, and he thought he was in love with his half-sister. And so he literally raped her. And David was furious, but never addressed it with his son. And that thing stood for two years. That, that young lady's name was Tamar, and her brother was Absalom. And Absalom waited for two years to get his vengeance, and he killed Amnon. And do you know what David said to Absalom about that? Nothing. He had a hard time being a father. He didn't deal with those things. In the cave, we see the best of David, but in other places, we see the worst of David. David was a complex character. He could be the most loyal friend you've ever seen. In fact, he was that kind of friend to Saul's son, whose name was Jonathan. He could be an incredibly generous person and give unbelievable uh, resources of what he had. He could walk into a situation of unbearable grief and he could, he could lean into it rather than run away from it. David could worship with unbelievable passion. He's known for that in scripture. He had, com he had remarkable compassion on other people. He's a person who's filled with contradictions. This is the point. The tendency of our culture today is to rewrite history and either take away all the bad things about his life that we don't want to know or to just eliminate him from history because of his incredible mistakes that he made in life. And scripture doesn't do that. The story, this is what's really important here. The story of David's life is not something scripture calls us to imitate. Scripture never says, try to be like David. The story of David is not about trying to be like David. The story of David is to illustrate the commitment of God, who regardless of how complicated you are and how many times you fail, God is committed to working his saving grace into your soul. Is that not good news? Is that not good news? That's his commitment to us. David is no picture of perfection. He's a picture of how God can shape a life because God is unrelenting in his grace. So of those 73 Psalms that are attributed to David, there's actually a number of them, seven of them, that are songs of, of repentance and songs of how he's managing his guilt and how he's processing his grief about his own behavior. And so we're going to look at a few of those this morning. And when we look at them, I'm going to ask us all to read them out loud together. And the reason that we're doing that is because I want us to be exposed to language that helps us deal with our failures and our, our challenges and our faults in life, but not just to hear them. I want our mouths to speak them. See, David prayed everything. He prayed his doubts. He prayed his fears. He prayed his hopes. He prayed his anger. He prayed his gratefulness. He prayed his successes. He prayed every single part of his life. There's a lot of wisdom in that. Some of us only pray very limited kinds of prayers. So seven of these Psalms are David responding to his own guilt. And these are the prayers for people who aren't perfect. How many would like to know about some prayers for imperfect people? Yeah. So here's the first one, Psalm 6. And let's read this out loud and together. I am worn out from my groaning. All night long, I flood my bed with weeping. Let's go back and try it again, all right? Out, let's declare this. Let's fill our mouths and this room with the language that helps us deal with failure. 
Once again, I am worn out from my groaning. All night long, I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. Sometimes the only place we allow our tears to flow is in our bed at night. And this passage says he soaks his bed with his tears. Tears can have all kinds of reasons behind them. We can shed tears because of our pain, because we have felt betrayed by someone, because we feel alone, alone, because we've experienced loss, because we're trying to process grief, because we've gone through relationships that aren't working out the way that we hoped and dreamed. And here's what David wants us to know, is that tears are a language that God understands. Lots of people are uncomfortable with tears, and when they see them in you, they will tell you, don't cry. And God doesn't come to tell you that tears aren't acceptable. He understands what drives those tears to begin with. And here's the point of the psalm. The things that make us weep can move us towards God. Just let that be a cue for you in life. Every time a, a tear wells up in your eye, what about your seeing or hearing or experiencing right then could move you towards God? Could help you start a conversation with him. Here's another psalm, Psalm 32, out loud and together. Then I acknowledge my sin to you. Let's try again. Ready? Then I acknowledge my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. We are actually capable of responding to sin in different kinds of ways. And it, for example, when we do something we know is out of bounds or we fail to do something we know we should have done, sometimes what we do is we deny that we had any responsibility or we rationalize why the action we took or failed to take actually made a lot of sense. And a, another thing that we tend to do is we'll make promises that we won't let that happen again. That becomes the salve that we put on that wound of sin. I just, well, I won't do that again. But here's what we need to know. The only thing, the only thing that really works regarding our sins is to confess our sins. Because what we need with our sins is not to be understood. What we need with our sins is to be forgiven. That's the point. People spend a lot of time trying to deal with their sins. And what we learn from this psalm is rather than trying to deal with your sins, deal with God. And let God deal with your sins. It's a profound and new approach to take. Rationalization and promises, they can sound very fake. You've heard the, the, your own voice try to rationalize something and, and thought to yourself, this this does not sound good. You've heard other people rationalize things and thought to yourself, this does not sound real. Sounds like they're making it up as they're speaking. But confessions, when they are real, they sound incredibly authentic. And here's the point I want you to take from this song, this psalm. Without confession, we cannot know the goodness of God's heart or the greatness of his grace. That's why the psalmist says, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave me the guilt of my sins. Psalm 38. Here's another prayer for people who struggle with failure. Psalm 38, out loud and together, ready? Lord, I wait for you. You will answer, Lord my God. For I said, do not let them gloat or exalt themselves over me when my feet slip. For I am about to fall and my pain is ever with me. I confess my iniquity. I am troubled by my sin. Many have become my enemies without cause. Those who hate me without reason are numerous. Those who repay my good with evil uh, accusations against me. Though I seek only to do what is good. Lord, do not forsake me. Do not be far from me, my God. Come quickly to help me, my Lord 
and my Savior. It is always easier to notice and focus on the sins of others. Always. Much easier to see someone else's faults and failures than our own. But here's what we have to remember. Sin is the common human denominator. You may come from a different ethnicity. You maybe have been raised in different environments by different kinds of families. You may have access to different kinds of education. You may have access to different kinds of resources or maybe no access to them at all. But the one common denominator that we all have is sin. And here's the thing. I cannot deal with the sin in my own life if I only focus on the sins of others. I can't deal with the sin of my own life if all I do is just focus on the sins of others. By the way, I cannot address the sins of others if I'm unable to deal with the sins of my own heart. We can assume that if we deal with our sins, the world will automatically be a better place, but that doesn't really take into account the sins that other people commit. And we can assume that if everybody else would stop sinning, our world would be a better place, but that doesn't take into account the sins that we commit. We assume that if we deal with our sins, the world will be better. And we assume if other people would just deal with their sins, the world would be better. But that doesn't account for our own sins and their sins if we only focus on one or the other. So what's our, what's our strategy? First, talk to God about your sins and the sins of others. Talk to God first. Different things are possible when we have a conversation with him first. Did you hear in the Psalm? Lord, I wait for you. You will answer my God. If we just focus on someone else's sin, something in us isn't going to be addressed. And if all we do is beat ourselves up, if all we do is focus on our own sins, then we'll never take any steps forward. Psalm 51, another Psalm. Let's read this out loud and together. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Everything God made is good. You can see it in, in the opening pages of Scripture in Genesis. Everything he makes, he gives the assessment, it's good. The problem isn't faulty workmanship. The problem is how we use what God has created. And as it turns out, we are capable of misusing and abusing any of God's creative works. And it's easy to focus on the things that are involved in sinning and then try to make rules and laws to outlaw those things. Here's, a, here's something that maybe you haven't thought about. A lot of times what Christians would like to do is outlaw all the things they're tempted by. Wouldn't it make sense to allow God to do something in us where we can overcome those temptations rather than surrender? But because we haven't had much success with that, our tendency is to try to outlaw the things that we are tempted by and susceptible to. And here's the challenge, is that when we try to outlaw something, we also try to outlaw what would be the appropriate use of that thing. And what we wind up is leaving the human situation less than what God intended. And as it turns out, when human beings have less than what God intended, we don't manage that well. We actually look for ways to medicate our disappointment and our pain. There's a, there's a phrase that gets used a lot of times when we talk about uh, 
uh, sin. And the word that gets associated with it is dirty. This word shows up a lot when we refer to sinful actions. You probably heard the expression, someone has a dirty mouth. You know what that means, right? Someone has a dirty mind. You know what that means. That's a dirty book. That's a dirty movie. That's a dirty website. You kind of know what that means. Here's the point. We cannot avoid getting dirty, but we don't have to stay dirty. Did you hear what the psalmist said? Cleanse me with hyssop. I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Psalm 102. Let's read this out loud and together. Hear my prayer, Lord. Let me cry for help come to you. Do not hide your face from me when I am in distress. Turn your ear to me when I call. Answer me quickly. God the Father could not be who he is without the Son and without the Holy Spirit. That eternal relationship helps to make them who they are. And that is likewise true for us. We cannot become who we are created to be absent of relationships, relationship with God and relationship with other people. The tendency of sin is always to isolate us from someone else. And we feel cut off from God and from others. And often the key to restoring relationship is actually to restore our relationship to God first. When you feel better connected with him, you have a reason source by which to restore the relationships in your life. It is God who first declared it is not good for people to be alone. Jesus knew what it was like to be abandoned by his friends, even though he committed no sins. He knew what it was like to feel forsaken by his father. You hear him utter those words on the cross, but Jesus doesn't stop talking to his father, and he doesn't stop calling his disciples. Jesus committed no sin, but he did experience incredible isolation. He still committed himself to his father, and he called and recalled his disciples into, into uh, ministry. This is a very important thing. When we're going through disappointment in ourselves or in others, there's a very powerful thing when we commit our lives back into the hands of God. I'm going to ask the worship team to come out. In our broken relationships, we often assume that the other person is the one who has all the power. And until, until they make it right, our life is ruined. And here's something I would like you to think about this morning. If I were to listen to your stories, I'm sure many of you have stories where someone else caused you great pain in your life. And this morning where you're sitting, it's, you're, you're, they ruined my life. And we imagine all the things that could have been if they had not done what they did. And what I would encourage you to do this morning is don't allow your life to be in their hands. They're not God. Regardless of how much pain you're going through, how much disappointment you've experienced from the life of others, their actions, their words, their behaviors, look to heaven. Utter the words of Jesus. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I'm putting my life in your hands because I don't completely trust what other people would do, even if they're well-intended with all that my life could be. But I can always trust you. And it's absolutely amazing when we put our life back in God's hands that the faults and the failures that we have had committed against us or committed by us, we begin to see how grace can work and seep into all of those things. And forgiveness begins to flow like a river and hope begins to appear on the horizon. And so that's my call to you today. Don't let your future be in someone else's hands. Put it in God's hands. Let's bow our heads this morning. Father, I know that even when we're heading in the right direction, sometimes we, we're not happy with how long it takes. And we get frustrated. 
I would ask that you would help us remember today that there's a lot more to following you than just getting to heaven. There's a lot more happening in our world than what we can do. That you are doing something. And so we can wait on you. We can commit our life into your hands. We can wait to recover from our injuries and our wounds. We can wait for you to do what we are unable to do on our own. Today we choose to wait on and trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.